Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH, and today we have the introduction of Project Tiny Mini Micro. Now, this is a project that I have wanted to do for absolutely years, and specifically, it's targeting those individuals who just need a pretty simple server. I mean, those are the folks that may need an AP controller, they may need something like a voice over IP controller, and just kind of simple applications in a small footprint. These servers are absolutely perfect small servers for the home. Now, if you wanna go a little bit bigger and you wanna get something like a clustered server, this is also a pretty good solution. Now, Project Tiny Mini Micro actually comes from the name of these, this class of devices and the manufacturers that actually produce them in huge quantities. And those are Lenovo, HP, and Dell. So if you're wondering, we're gonna be using the Lenovo Tiny Nodes, we're gonna be using the HP mini nodes, and then we're gonna be using the Dell micro nodes. Now we're gonna get into the details of all of these things, and if you haven't seen from the thumbnail pic of this video, we have a whole bunch of these that we're gonna talk about a little bit later, but what I did wanna do is just kinda of talk about why. Why would we even look at this class of device versus looking at other options on the market? Personally, what got me very interested in these is just, number one, they're low cost, but then also there are a lot of applications nowadays that assume that you're going to be running a cluster of machines and not just one machine. As the cloud providers and things like Kubernetes have gotten very popular, the idea of scaling out infrastructure to multiple nodes as kind of a default behavior has become basically the norm. But the reasons behind it make a lot of sense. I mean, with multiple nodes, you can have things like high availability and fault tolerance that you don't really get if you have a single node. And using PCs as servers, especially at the edge, may seem completely crazy, but let's not forget that Chick-fil-A actually uses Intel NUC devices in their retail locations to provide on-site Kubernetes clusters. So this isn't something that's just a totally random idea. I mean, there is literally a large company deploying edge Kubernetes using basically desktop PCs. And that brings us to a question, Patrick, why aren't you using Intel NUX here? And there's a really good reason for that. Now, NUX are very cool machines. I actually really like them and they're very hip. I mean, people get very excited about Intel NUX, but on the other hand, Dell, HPE, and Lenovo sell an absolute ton of these tiny mini microsystems. And because they do that, the quality on them is just absolutely in a completely different tier. They're generally available on the secondhand market for a very pretty low price because there's tons of them and, well, they come up for the secondhand market quite often. And the other kind of cool thing about them is that they have much better support. I mean, the documentation behind these nodes is just absolutely amazing. So there's a lot going for them. And also, if you wanted to build something like a Chick-fil-A Edge compute platform for your business, Remember that these little nodes actually have the ability to have on-site support, which you don't really have with normal NUC sales, but you can actually go get these nodes and have Lenovo, Dell, or HP show up and fix anything that goes wrong. And just touching specifically on the lab environment, a lot of times people are using used gear. And when you do that and you look at the class of nodes that we're seeing here, all the nodes that we purchased are basically between about $200 and $400. And the vast majority of them are basically in the maybe 225 to 325 range. One of the big drivers here is that these things are sold in absolutely massive deals. And when companies decide that it's time to do a refresh, there are other events like such as a company going bankrupt or going out of business and they no longer need the PCs, so they get liquidated. And there's a lot of events that lead to these units hitting the secondary market and in just ginormous quantities. I mean, the number of units sold for these versus like a consumer motherboard is just many, many to one. Now, if you saw some of our HPE ProLiant microserver Gen 10 Plus coverage, you'll notice that we were actually making a cluster with that. And that actually made us kind of really look at these classes of devices because we had these fairly small server boxes, but they were still pretty big. And we wanted something that was a little bit smaller, a little bit less costly, but we didn't necessarily need three and a half inch disk support. And these fit the bill just perfectly. 
The general layout of these things is all pretty much the same. You get a number of USB ports and display outputs on the front and rear of the units. Now, the display outputs, usually you get display ports. Sometimes you get up to three display ports. Sometimes you get some HDMI or VGA mixed in there. Sometimes you don't get as many, but that's certainly something that's kind of cool. You almost always get multi-monitor support. You have a processor that's sometimes socketed, which means that you can actually upgrade these things. Power is provided by an external power brick on all of the units, and that's just pretty standard. But the power bricks actually come from the company's laptop lines, and so there's something that you can actually go out and get replacements for super easily. Storage is usually a two and a half inch internal disk along with an M.2 form factor drive. So in most of these units, you can get, say, an NVMe SSD plus a SATA SSD. So if you want to go build a little bit of storage in these units, it totally works. There's usually two SODIMM slots, especially nowadays DDR4 SODIMM slots. And so hitting up to 32 gigs of memory is fairly inexpensive. And if you just want 16 gigs of memory, well, that's very inexpensive to do. It usually costs about $55. The processors themselves, there are some two core units, but realistically, most of them these days are Core i5. So you'll see four core, four thread units and some of the newer Core i3s were doing the same thing. But you also can find units with features like six core, six thread Core i5s and some of the later models. Again, these are not huge units. And we just did a video on barbecue and virtualization where we talked about why you actually want a larger node over a bunch of separate smaller nodes using barbecue as an example. But still, there are many cases where you do want to have separate nodes. And this is a good example of where you can get something fairly inexpensively. Now, of course, I think a lot of you are going to be saying, hey, Patrick, what about the Raspberry Pi 4? And actually, the Raspberry Pi 4 8 gigabyte did precipitate this entire project. When I heard that the Raspberry Pi 4 8 gigabyte models were launched, I got really excited and I started ordering them. And specifically what I did was I ordered it from Canakit because, well, I like to support the community. I know you can get the devices and all the components a little bit less expensively, but realistically, it's nice to have someone else just go pick it up and get you a kit that is easy to use without having to think about it. And I'm more than happy to go support the community by throwing a couple extra dollars that way. But the pricing on the Raspberry Pi is a little bit of a misnomer, right? I mean, if you get the actual unit for $75, you can't turn it on. You may have some cooling issues. You don't have a case. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that you need before you can really get started with the Raspberry Pi 4 8 gigabyte model. So I got two of the Canakit Raspberry Pi 4 8 gigabyte starter kits that were about $140 before tax and shipping. They took so long to arrive that I decided, well, maybe there's another option and is there an x86 option that I could just use? And that's how we got on this entire tiny mini micro project. So by the time they arrived, I realized that the Raspberry Pi 4 8 gigabyte, they're actually really cool devices, especially if you wanna go and put them on a little robotics project or something like that, where you need that small form factor and super low power consumption, they actually work really well. But if you kind of think about it, you're getting basically for about $140, you're getting a eight gigabyte machine with some low core count ARM CPUs. And on the tiny mini micro side, in the $250 range, I'm usually getting a 256 gigabyte SSD. So we're not using an SD card for storage here. And I'm also getting up to either eight or 16 gigs of RAM plus a quad core processor. Plus, in a lot of cases, I actually have the option for NVMe SSD. So the SSDs are much higher quality. The cases are much higher quality on the tiny mini micro units. And so overall, I think that there's actually a case to be made that these are fairly, at least fairly analogous to what you would get on the Raspberry Pi side. Now, Raspberry Pis do use way less power, but on the other hand, the tiny mini micro nodes actually use less power, especially at idle, than you typically see from server nodes. So again, I don't want anybody to think like, oh, hey, you should definitely be using the Raspberry Pi 4. Why is Patrick not using that? It's not that I don't like the Raspberry Pi 4. I mean, order a bunch of them. It's actually just the fact that I kind of found this as an alternative to somebody that maybe wants an x86 platform or more robust platform than what the Raspberry Pi offers. There are all kinds of different people out there. So I think it's important to kind of give people options. So let's talk about getting into Project Mini Micro a little bit, because we've talked about the nodes already, but let's talk about what happened. So the first nodes I bought were actually HP Mini I think they were like the 705 G3 Mini and they use these AMD Pro A6 processors. And those are absolutely anemic core wise. But the interesting things I at least thought about these nodes was, was that I purchased them for like under $225. They had 16 gigabytes of RAM. They also had a 256 gig 
SATA SSD. And so I was just looking at it, I was like, well, that RAM is actually pretty good. The SSD is pretty good and it makes the processor basically free. I have to say that they were definitely not the best value, even though the RAM and SSDs were great. And for some people, they're actually gonna work out super well. But for me and what I was looking for, they were not the right option. And that kind of started down the path of this going from being a single purchase to actually being an entire project. And then I realized what might be the absolute most killer feature of the entire segment by far. And that is that these nodes actually come usually and not always with Windows 10 Pro. Now, the way that the model works is that the Windows 10 Pro license is actually tied to the motherboard and firmware in these units. So therefore, you actually get a licensed Windows 10 Pro installation for these machines without even having to put in the license key. What's really important here, and I wanna make this very clear, is that not all of them come with that. Some come with Windows 10 Home. There are also some that come with DOS, and so they don't come with Windows 10 Pro. So one thing that you have to be a little bit wary of is if you do specifically want that feature because you're not gonna run Linux or VMware or something like that on these, you need to look for it. Windows 10 Pro is a huge deal. I mean, remember, most of these units that we're buying are in the $200 to $300 range, and a Windows 10 Pro license by itself is like, I don't know, 140 bucks or something like that. So you're getting an amazing software value just irrespective of anything else. And you actually get features in these things that are really useful, such as you can do things like you do remote desktop, you can also have active directory integration. And so there are definitely use cases here that are super useful to have the pro license versus a normal home license. And Windows 10 Pro is actually super cool for another reason, and that's that Microsoft has really gone in on the Windows subsystem for Linux too. And now you can actually run things in Windows and still have a Linux environment. And perhaps the one thing that got me completely hooked by this was when I actually got the first unit and I realized I could have Windows 10 Pro running and then underneath have Kubernetes running on WSL2. Let me explain why that is the coolest feature. You can actually have a Windows 10 Pro box that you put out and you give to a significant other, to a kid, whatever you have, someone you can put out your Windows 10 Pro box and they think, hey, I have an awesome desktop experience. I may have 16 gigs of RAM. I can go browse using Google Chrome, Microsoft Edge or whatever it is. These machines are meant to be great desktops for business productivity. So anything that falls in that, watching YouTube videos, all that kind of stuff, you can totally go do that on the Windows 10 Pro. But where this gets really exciting is that in a lot of cases, you can actually run your lab on a Linux box. And if you're running on that WSL2 box, you're running Linux, you can actually have an entire lab that nobody really knows about. You could be giving your kid a little box and your significant other may think that you're just being a benevolent person purchasing your child a box. And guess what? It's actually part of your lab because it's running WSL2 underneath. This is the absolute definition of a stealth lab. The other thing is that these things are super small. So even if you just wanna go build a little stack of them, you can actually stack them on top of one another. And when I did that next to an HP microserver Gen 10 Plus, what I noticed was that basically you can go have an entire cluster in the footprint of a single Xeon E2200 series node. So once I realized that we had a great hardware value, some extra software value add, I looked at this and I said, okay, this is something that could be an awesome project. And that's when I just started buying nodes. So at the time I'm recording this, we've already purchased 18 nodes with 15 different models. This has escalated very quickly. We've purchased a bunch of units, specifically the HP Elite Desk and Pro Desk mini units. We have a bunch of those. We also have the Lenovo tiny units. We have the Dell Optiplex micro units. And so we have a whole bunch of different types of nodes. We've also purchased them from different sources, which means that we've hit some of the pitfalls. We've seen machines that are perfectly clean. We've also seen some so dirty that they basically didn't work without a proper cleaning. We've seen nodes that were advertised as one thing that showed up as something completely different. We've seen different specs. We've seen some nodes that have some funky internal bits that we weren't expecting. And so by getting a whole bunch of these nodes and working with them for the past month, we've actually learned so much more than if we only had one or two of these nodes. If you're wondering about the power consumption and performance, well, the power consumption at idle is actually really interesting. We can get idle usually in the about nine to maybe 12 watt range plus or minus one watt on either side. And that's really good because on a server like the HP Microserver Gen 10 Plus or any other kind of server, even if you have the main server off, the baseboard management controller actually uses 
usually north of four and a half to maybe six watts. And because that uses so much power, even when you have the system on, your idle power consumption is way over 10 watts. So these units are actually built to be extremely power efficient because they don't have those baseboard management controllers. Performance of them is not as good as the Xeon E2200 series. You may say, hey, they come with four core, eight core processors. Why is it not the same performance as the Xeon E2200 series? And there's a really simple answer for that. These things are usually 35 watt TDP parts and they just don't have the thermal headroom to go and hit the same performance as you would see in some of the higher end Xeon E2200 series models. What you do get is performance, call it maybe from some of the higher end Atom C3000 series machines to kind of the lower middle end of the Xeon E2200 series. And we've done a whole bunch of benchmarks, so we're gonna be releasing that information kind of in a more up-level data set pretty soon. Management on these boxes is super interesting because you can actually get either Intel AMT or vPro, and you can also get AMD Dash. Now what that means is that you actually get things like remote power on and off, even though you don't have a traditional baseboard management controller like you would have in a normal server. With vPro, you can actually get a special real VNC viewer that allows you to get things like remote management and remote KVM. These solutions are really meant more for a desktop environment. They're not as good as what you get in servers, and what you're gonna notice is that the Dell PowerEdge T40 doesn't have it either because the iDRAC controller actually costs too much money and so they use Intel AMT and vPro just like these corporate desktops. Now there's AMD Dash and there's Intel vPro and AMT, but what we found was that they're not always enabled on all the boxes and it's not necessarily easy to tell which ones are and which ones are not because Intel AMT and vPro actually has a different set of features if it's designed to potentially be exported to certain countries. Again, this is stuff that we've learned with Project Tiny Mini Micro because we've purchased so many units, there's things that you just find like that. There are also units that just simply use lower end chipsets so don't have things like the remote KVM functionality. So if you can't tell, we're running an entire series on this. This is gonna be an awesome project. I just wanna do a quick video to introduce what we're doing. Now, if you go out and purchase these units today, just know that there's a huge variability in terms of what you get. The goal of Project Tiny Mini Micro is to really break down what those differences are and help you as a buyer figure out, okay, if I'm gonna go build a low power, low cost cluster for my home environment, what does that look like and what should I be looking for in any of the used listings out there? And by the way, any of this stuff is super translatable to something that even if you needed to purchase new machines for your work or corporate environment, you wanted to do something like Chick-fil-A did, where you're using these nodes as edge Kubernetes servers, this is totally translatable to that as well. You can even just go buy the nodes and get them with on-site warranty support, no problem. So this is something that is actually a prototype that you could pull directly into production very easily. So if you can't tell, I'm super excited about Project Tiny Mini Micro. We've been working on it for over a month now, and we have some really cool things that are gonna be coming out. So stay tuned to the STH YouTube channel. Definitely subscribe, check out the STH main site because we're gonna have new content on this throughout the summer. As always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.